All right, so looking at sulfur, and actually on your periodic table, what you'll notice is underneath um, the information for that element, above the element name, there is uh, something that looks like an electron configuration, but it's a little bit different. So notice that this says neon symbol in brackets, and then it says 3s23p4. So I'll show you what that means. So I'll write it down here. So it says neon and then 3s2, 3p4. So what this is called is an abbreviated electron configuration. So what that means is instead of writing the entire configuration out, they are using the symbol of the noble gas that it is passed. So for example, neon is here, there's 10 electrons. So it's kind of like a short form. It's saying neon has 10 electrons, and then these are the extra electrons on top of neon. So remember that neon has 10 electrons, and then this is representing the six extra electrons because there's 16 total. So it's like neon's configuration plus there's 3s2, 3p4, okay? Now when you're asked to do the electron configuration, I'm always asking for the full thing, not the abbreviation, okay? Also, there is a website. Yeah, so periodicptable.com, okay, is an interactive periodic table. So you can look at the, let me expand this for a second. I don't know if it'll let me do this. Okay, so uh, ptable.com. Dot com and the symbol looks like that there are different periodic tables you can look at based on properties based on the electrons isotopes and compounds that they make it's actually a very cool site so the if you go to the electrons periodic table you'll notice that uh, in this center block here if you type if you click on an element or you kind of hover over an element it shows the electron configuration but in an energy level diagram. So notice, if I hit magnesium, I have 1s, 2s, 2p, and 3s filled in. It also has the electron configuration on the left-hand side. So it has the short form and the expanded, which is nice. It tells you the quantum numbers of the electrons and the energy levels. So this is actually a beautiful site to use. It even has the oxidation states, which we'll be needing uh, later on in the course, okay? Now, what I'm gonna bring your attention to is actually the colors that are being shown right now. And that's actually the last piece to this lesson here. The organization on the periodic table is actually, um, when Mendeleev first put it together, it went in order of atomic number, right, or atomic mass. Um, and it kind of made sense with the chemical families, right? It had patterns to the periodic table. But what was later discovered as we knew more and more about the atom is that not only did the patterns of the chemical and physical properties exist, but actually the patterns of the electron configurations also existed. Now, the only thing that's a little bit different about this periodic table is they brought helium over here you know, on your standard periodic table, helium is actually where the noble gases are right up here. Okay, so just be mindful of that. So what you'll notice is the first two groups are highlighted as S block groups. So what that means is these, elect these atoms, I should say, all have their last electron in an S orbital. So for example, if I go to lithium, 2s. Beryllium, right? 2s, it's the second electron. Sodium, 3s. Strontium, 5s. So the last electron placed is in the s block. And actually, everything in group number one has one electron in its s block. And everything in group number two has two electrons in its s block. Now, the number of the S that it is has to do with the period that it's in. Notice 
Period number three, magnesium, we're looking at the 3s orbital. If I look at rubidium, it's in the 5s orbital. It's in period number five. Pretty cool. If you look at this right-hand side where we have this kind of tealy color, this is known as the P block electrons, or I should say, pardon me, atoms. So what ends up happening here is the last electron that is placed in all of these elements is in the P orbital set. Again, what P orbital? It has to do with the period that it's in. So for example, let's go back to good old sulfur. Sulfur is in period number three. So this is, we're talking about the 3P orbital set. And actually, the column that it's in tells us how many electrons are there. So for example, everything in column 13 or group 13 has one P orbital. So let's look at aluminum, 3P1, silicon, 3P2, phosphorus, 3P3, sulfur, 3P4, 3P5, 3P6. There are six columns in this P block, right? There are six electrons that can fit inside of a P orbital set. Pretty wild. And so far it's matching up with everything we've been saying. The center block here, so the transition metals are what are known as the D block elements. So if you'll notice here, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 uh, columns in this block. And guess what? There are 10 electrons that can fit inside of our 3D orbital set. So here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Right? So when you're looking at this, be mindful that this is now part of our overlapped areas of space. So if you recall, if we were to go from left to right here, this actually goes along with the order of our energy levels. So 4s comes before 3d. All of these are part of the 3d block. And then it continues on into 4P. So if you were to kind of go from left to right along the periodic table, it matches up exactly with the orbitals in our energy level diagrams. And our F block elements, which are the lanthanides and actinides down here, there are 14 inside of this row. They fill up our 14 electrons in our seven orbital F blocks. So there is a relationship between orbital placement or configuration and how the periodic table is laid out. Okay, so that kind of goes exactly with what I was going to mention here as part of our notes. So we've already gone through that. So we have our S block, we have our P block our D and our F, okay? So um, that ptable.com is actually a really nice website to use to have an understanding in case you kind of forget that. Um, but it's kind of cool how going from left to right, going down the different periods, it matches up with our configurations. Okay, so let's look at, um, if you are writing out the shorthand configuration here, this is just showing an example of lead. We've already talked about this, but remember that the shorthand is always the noble gas of the uh, period before your element, and then it includes the extra electrons. So this is, the point of this is I want to talk about ion charges and just remind you of removing electrons, what happens. So lead has two possible states that it can be in. We can have lead positive two, or lead positive four, right? It's a transition metal. Now, when you are removing those electrons, be mindful, and the reminder is here, you must remove from the highest N number first. So in this particular element, we have 6S2 and 6P2. So we're not gonna touch the four and five because remember, 
the energy level number six is higher. So when we're talking about the positive two charge, we're removing two electrons. So the two electrons they would be removed would be the six P um, electrons. That would be our positive two. If we had to continue losing electrons, we would to continue to remove them. So if we wanted to show positive four, we would have to remove those two first and our 6s2 after. So remember, you would not touch the 4f or the 5d because it's the highest n number first. Okay, magnetism. So this kind of goes um, a little bit away from what we've been discussing, but it is a, a property of a lot of elements and it kind of the understanding of this property becomes more clear once you understand how electrons move in an atom. Okay, so first of all, um, there are two types of magnet magnetic elements. So we have something called a ferromagnetic element and a paramagnetic element, okay? So a ferromagnetic element, there's actually only three elements that, this, that fall under that category. We have iron, cobalt, and nickel. So these are elements that have a very strong magnetic field. So let's talk about what actually creates that magnetic field. And the key to this is unpaired electrons. You have to have orbitals that have electrons in them, but have only one electron in them, not two. So I'll just quickly you know, write an example of what I mean by that. So these would be three unpaired electrons. Now I have two electrons that are unpaired, right? They don't have a set. And if I were to do this, this is no unpaired electrons. So how magnetism works is that if you have electron, uh, electrons that are unpaired, now naturally you may have some that are half um, that are kind of spinning in opposite directions of each other, right? So you may have some with a positive and some with a negative spin. But what happens when you have them all spinning in the same direction is those wave-like pattern movements of the electrons, once they're all in the same spin, create a magnetic field. So first of all, you cannot have a magnet without having unpaired electrons. And actually, the more unpaired electrons you have, the stronger that magnet is going to be. So what happens with these ferromagnetic elements, not only do they have several electrons that are unpaired, but they actually are easy to orient so that they're all lined up in the same direction. And a lot of the time, you may even find that they are already that way, so they have a magnetic field on their own. Okay, so paramagnetic elements are elements that have unpaired electrons as well, but they're not as dense as iron, cobalt, and nickel. So meaning, you may have a lot of unpaired electrons, but there's not as many atoms in the same amount of space. So if you were to take kind of two chunks of the exact same um, size, but one was iron and let's say, um, I don't know, another one was lead, just saying. So then the iron, because it's more dense, there are more atoms here. So naturally you're gonna have more electrons that are able to spin in that same direction to create that magnetic field. So not only does it have to do with unpaired electrons, but I guess the more electrons you have that are doing this, that are traveling in the same direction, the stronger that magnet will be.